I think it's, um, I always get very emotional when I come back to Bangalore and uh, sitting next to Chandan reminds me of the beautiful conversation we had with Girish Karnad uh, not too long ago. It kind of, it's when everything is, we d divide the time now into pre and co post COVID, so that was pre COVID time. But I'm very, very happy that the festival is back on track. It's so vibrant, so many people. Uh, I haven't been to too many events after COVID, so this is uh, really a pleasure. I think it's the first time back in Bangalore after a few years. Uh, let's just jump into the matter of uh, the book. I think the first question and the first um, point that I would like to raise is as an outsider, insider, someone who's studied and analyzed uh, a lot of the personalities and the material that you deal with there. Uh, the first question would be quite a simple answer, uh, maybe easy to answer, but the title is already a statement, right? Another India. What are you trying to imply with the title? Was it difficult to find the title? You have a subtitle, Events, Memories, People. It also helps, at least in the first edition, you don't have, there's a second edition here, I'm gonna show the book. So do you, th you thought it necessary to have a subtitle? Yes. What is the aim of the book? What did you want to achieve with the book? And was it difficult for you or was it just, did it come natural as leaves to a tree, <laughs> uh, as Keats would say, uh, to find, to have that title? Um, thank you, Guillermo. Um, no, the title came naturally, like the leaves to a tree. I mean, it, there was hardly any effort. I mean, it struck me as the one to use. Um, yeah, I mean, if you read the book, you will see that there is no India in it, actually. I mean, it is another India is a way of getting you to pause to think that there's something outside of the India you think you know. And what that is is something the book will try to lay bare in different ways, different forms. Um, but really, uh, it does not actually uh, leave you with another object called another India, but it will have shaken up your sense of the country of you thought you knew. I mean, that's the, that's what I think it will do to most uh, modern readers. I mean, with the, Guillermo, the um, aim of the book, the way you asked me to uh, spell out, is essentially to get us to see what might be in front of us by way of a sound, an image, a story, but which we are simply not literate enough to recognize for what they are. And this is a way of nudging us. Just imagine you're an auto rickshaw driver, auto rickshaw, an Uber cab, and you see a sticker of a man who looks like a guru or, 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 some, or, or a photograph of a god whom you don't recognize. Uh, you can be sure that there's an, a huge tradition behind it, a living tradition uh, in, the, in, the ten, in, in terms of people who know the story, who, are, who feel like it, it is part of their lives in an important sense, et cetera. So here is the problem, right? In the sense, we are all living, we talk of pluralism, diversity, et cetera. But really, we are uh, moving around, not, uh, things aren't legible. And this is one way of getting you to see those things that you would ordinarily not look at. This is one way of describing the book's ambition. Okay, um, before we enter to the content, I think, um, you know, coming from the outside to the inside of the book, yeah. Uh, of course, it could have been called many Indias as well, yes. not just another India, because another in India implies that there is another India. Yes. Um, and the whole, the first question I asked him when I, when I read the book was, um, I think the beauty of the book lies in the fact that the way it's put together is already implying the content. It's written in a style in a way that takes fragments from here and there. It makes a statement just by being what it is, like a, a tapestry of voices, of stories. I'd rather, I like the, you know, it's stories. It's yes. people, but it's stories. It's their stories, it's folk stories, it's oral stories. And it's a tapestry of all of that. And it doesn't want to necessarily interconnect things, but you make the connections you come along. And as A.K. Ramanujan would, would say, the content, the, the form tells the content, the content uh, relates to the form yes. in, in ways that we sometimes don't, would not, you know, have fathomed yes. 
when we have the book in front of us, we realize at the end. The, from a discourse point of view, of course the book is making all these statements by not being an abstract or theoretical book. We have had a lot of ac academic discussions, uh, Chandan. Do you think uh, people, readers, would want to interpret the book in terms of modern discourse, the tradition, the modern, the postmodern? Uh, I think there's a very strong statement against categories, yes. against binaries, and it's part of the book, if I infer that correctly. Yes. Uh, are you on purposely trying to avoid those categories, the discourse, because you think it's something we should maybe leave aside for a moment? Thank you, Guillermo. I mean, that's an essential feature of the book. I mean, the binaries of the modern and tradition, and secular and the religious, uh, usually are, you know, makes you take sides. I mean, everyone wants to be modern, typically, right? And when you, when you pick a way of thinking, a whole host of other things simply don't seem to you seem important for you to think about or to consider. So yeah, I think the contents, and I don't explicitly uh, you know, nudge you to think like this, but the idea is that, like Girmo was saying, it comes in, in, the contents of the book are in different forms, retellings, sometimes essays, but with little commentary of mine, it's about just showing and not really telling too strongly. And the idea is that you should encounter them and let them do to you without uh, me mediating it too much. Um, but <clears throat> I hope cumulatively, or however you begin, uh, you'll end up with a kind of an encounter that I think uh, is not something you'd run into in the natural course of your reading. Mm -hmm. um, and Guillermo, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the binaries have made enormous, uh, cost us dearly, our intellectual life dearly. Uh, when you say, this is, I'm a modern sociologist, the entire archive that appears to be a religious archive, or the theological archive, or the, or the vernacular archive even, I just, you just keep it aside. You do an analysis and it's not important for you to be, engage them. And I'm trying to tell you that these worlds matter because they're living worlds. You know when the Grimm's brothers uh, presented their fairy tales to Europe for the first time in the early 19th century, Europe had forgotten those stories completely. But if you present these stories, they will seem new to us, but to many, 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 they are part of their everyday memories. So there is a split, a running split, that shows no signs of uh, weakening. And I'm just hoping that this book will somehow do something yeah. there. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who have not read the book, it's, um, it's a journey through people's lives at some point. It's a journey through oral tra stories, traditions, he moves at ease. Um, I like to compare it with uh, the, you know, the work of an anthropologist who is leaving aside at some point his academic work, his notepad, he sets it aside. The way you can do field work is, you, know, you can do it in a very rational way, you can do it the way the first folklorist did, uh, try to analyze the material. When you read the book, it's just like, you know, someone who's just part of the scene. It's somebody who's, who's actually been there, has treaded the terrain, has heard those stories. Uh, you, it's not artificial, it's, it's real. And I think um, if this was made into a film, it would be showing all that reality, like, more like a documentary yeah. rather than a work of fiction. So I don't know if you, if you like the, that definition of it. I feel like a docu. Of course, you always make, there are stories, but you listen to people. You, you have heard people talk to you. So how much of the material is you know, first-hand, second? Of course, there's a lot of work that is through second, secondary sources. Yeah. But, uh, and, and then, which brings us to the other fact, what would you tell apart is not, what exactly is not an anthropologist's approach, what you're doing there, uh, whether it is subaltern or folklore, because there is a lot of folklore. I don't really like the term folklore. Yeah. For instance, in, in Spain, we t think, tend to think it's folklore is, you know, it's the German, Germanic, uh, Anglo-Saxon Germanic, uh, we call it popular traditions. We, yes. we use the word popular, popular. Please. Thank you. Even I don't like the term folklore, and none of you should either. Because, folk because it's folk. living lore. 
And when you say folklore, there's a strange way in which you put it aside and you think that it's is old, archaic, uh, musty, something that is a museum-like object. It's not uh, living, but a lot of folk tales are actually living. And, uh, and you know, they're not just tales as in a story, right? I mean, the, because if you look at them, on surface, you could simply think of them as a story, but if you look inside, they're actually offering a philosophy of you know, how to be in a good society, or how does one be good, etc. These fundamental moral questions are being addressed, but in, the, in, a, in a deceptively simple form called the folk story, and which is what anthropologists have called them. They don't, you know, please remember folk stories don't have a title. They don't call themselves folk stories. They just come as stories. It's the collectors who give them titles and who uh, try to give them region names, etc. But going back to the question you raised earlier, Guillermo, the form content question, it's an old question. It does matter. You know, what we have in our everyday mainstream commentaries are analyses, right? Hard, logical analyses of social, cultural phenomena. And, and we think that's how social thinking has to happen. But that's a very, that's one way of how you think about the world. A lot of, you know, uh, stories, and you know, all, and, and, and you know, proverbs, etc. There are many, many ways of thinking about the world, seriously, and they don't come with an analytical burden. I mean, they just come to you as a picture, as a portrait of something. It's, and it's to just touch you and make you think of things in a certain way. And we are the ones who are constantly analyzing. So I just wanted us to get a break from analytical thinking. That is the dominant mode of thinking that you run into in everyday analysis so and also to try to be you know, how do we be, how does one be creative in how one thinks uh, in images um, in visual schemes and please remember even the folk stories you know, we have actually reduced them by giving them a prose form they're usually heard uh, they're sung they, it's multi-dimensional and they're sung through the night so they're also st strategically trying to keep you awake which makes them a different kind of a storytelling exercise altogether it, there's a lot going on there, and which gets reduced inevitably when you try to put them in the form of print prose. Mm. Uh, that I couldn't do much about, but I just alert you in the footnotes that there's more to this than what appears. But um, Guillermo referred to the personal interactions I've had. They are with a few individuals who I've had the good fortune of knowing, but I talk about them not in the sense of, ah, here is someone I knew, but just to um, show them as, um, as world makers and makers of a world. You know, you're, you're trying to actively shape the world around you in a certain way. So those actions are not meant to exemplify a model of doing things. I mean, they're not, they're not like you know, representative actions. Right? It's, they're virtuous actions in the sense they're ways of being imaginative and creative and ethically uh, brilliant, but it's their way of doing that. And you'll have to find your ways of doing that. I mean, they're not at all set up as uh, you know, exemplars. But again, getting us to think, you know, everyone talks of the constitution and the set of rights and duties we have, etc. But then for those rights to activate themselves, you need a, a milieu, a social milieu that allows for them to be activated and honored and fulfilled properly. And that work of getting minds to change or to think differently, you know, in the modern world has happened from a variety of sources literature, reformers, moralists, painters, poets, and, uh, and often who don't figure in our scheme of you know, who the activists are. But I think a lot of you know, fine nudges have been offered from a variety of places. This book is also trying to get you to look at those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that brings me to the other uh, issue here. You have all that material, okay? You present the material, whether it's folk, st folk stories, oral tales, protagonists, historical figures, but the way you present material, yeah. like a, you know, somebody who does a documentary film, it's very important how you present the material and what you're trying to say. There is a statement because every story, every aesthetics, every form has a political angle, has an ideology. You know, there is something behind it. You want, you want to make a statement. So in this regard, you have moral issues. You touch on aesthetic issues. You touch on ideological issues. Uh, on how we interpret the past and the modern. And I can sense also 
because we are more or less the same generation, I, yes. I have a feeling. So yeah. growing up in the 90s, I lived in India, you, you were studying and, and then you know, got getting involved with all these people firsthand. Uh, we were looking at the modernists in a way that you know, we were not exactly part of. We were, we were more of the postmodern world, the plural, the plural, plural, plurality. Uh, to what extent is that also kind of a critique of the modernists? And what is your, you know, uh, whether there's a political angle to the book, and even in the title. Yeah. So give us your thoughts on that, the way you wanted to present the material, what did you want to, uh, you know, is, it, is there a statement towards a certain group of people that you're addressing this book to? <laughs> <laughs> so there are many groups of people I think I was trying to address. Thank you, Guillermo. Um, the modernists are definitely one of them. Um, uh, see, one of the things that I, uh, I'm you know, concerned about and um, is these, how, powerful ideologies have become in trying to get us to think of the world. And uh, uh, just about everything in the book is non-ideological, not in the sense of party ideology, but trying to come with an a some you know, previous understanding of how something has to be and then everything else falls into place, right? So how you can be ethically serious without being ideological. And the examples you find in this book are of those kinds people being very serious about being good in the world, but not being ideological. So, the, so ideological means what? You, you're not sensitive to context. You have a ready-made frame. You, you take that to every different situation and understand those situations, right? But these things will tell you that you, every situation demands a, a kind of attentiveness, a moral attentiveness. Um, you know, the integrity of the situation demands that. So I think that's what I was... Uh, also careful about, but you know the thing about modernists and um, and the harm they may have done. Or the one other thing, I don't want to come down too heavily on the modernists. We are all modern. There's no escaping that, and we have gained from certain modern ways of thinking. And there is there's that definitely to acknowledge. But um, the thing that I had in mind was uh, modernists congratulate themselves too prematurely, I think, on having the right moral attitude to a variety of social questions, right? We think tradition or the world, the old world or the non-modern world is riddled with illiberal attitudes and we just need to make them think differently and the job of reforming their minds is ours, etc. But if without bothering to get into those worlds, when you get into those worlds, you'll find that they were anyway uncomfortable about a lot of things themselves. And they were themselves trying to correct a lot of these things. So how have they felt uncomfortable? What are the, what are the ways in which they felt gender was a problem or caste was a problem or something else was a problem? It's not that we were not the first to see them as problems. They have been seen as problems before in different ways. And those memories are important to encounter. And that's something that I do. That's, it's, it's, it's just you know, to get rid of your own high-handedness. The modern reformers can be high-handed in thinking, I have all the answers in how to understand a problem, how to deal with it. But that's maybe one way of thinking, but there have been a variety of ways of thinking. And if you want to shape a democratic politics today and make them inclusive, participatory, all these words everybody loves, you better do something about your intellectual practices. You know, what do you bring to the table by way of a memory or by way of a text, etc.? And I think that's what I was trying to do um, yeah, well, yeah. Okay, and now since we don't have much time and we yeah. want to take questions as well, yeah. uh, the uh, way you are shaped, a person like you who's grown up in South India and uh, you've uh, been influenced by a range of uh, voices, yeah. um, if you had to identify uh, a source of inspiration uh, what, is it the anonymous voices that are there, or is it more the, in, and there are some big names that you mentioned, others that are not so well known, and others, and I like the fact that you t take from a range of, very different range of writers and thinkers, which source of inspiration, you know, who's, who's your uh, saint whom you pray to when you say, oh, I need inspiration, where does my inspiration come? Is it, a, is it one of those you know, very down to as goddesses or gods. Yeah. You know, I'm using metaphors. Is it, is it the anonymous? And uh, like many artists who perform, 
and you're also performing here. You know, where do you draw your inspiration from? Is it is it the voices of the gurus that I know more? Would you be able to, you know, highlight two or three names, or you wouldn't you be able to do it? It's just the the whole tapestry that has informed you as a thinker, as a person, as a human being. Yeah. Or you. is there like any tip like you have to read this? You know, you have to listen to this, or you know, what is your wish list of people that you would like to, you know, if you had one hour to spend in your life, I would <sighs> fish out this person, this one, I, you know, you have one hour in your life, and you have one hour to spend on the dais here with someone, whom would you choose? Huh, tricky question, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, there are actually many people. If I can step back. You have one hour, you have to choose two or three names. And I would choose Tarkovsky, who is not in this book. In fact, I would choose Kurosawa, who is not in this book, or Bergman. I mean, these are people who, if you've seen their films and the people I talk about, all of them share a kind of a, a suspicion of modernity. There's a way in which they think uh, modern ways of thinking are falling short. And there's ways in which you have to make space for the transcendental, the way something about you know the poetic, the But you're skipping the imagined. question. You're not fair to the guys that okay, are here. Okay, I'll... I'll pick the village goddesses. I think I would love to be with them if they are there. That's because for, the, for me, they embody a kind of an extraordinarily deep hum, humanist sensibility. If you listen to the stories behind these goddesses, they're like great stories. Okay. Um, Gilmo, before okay, we I, I, hand I, it I over to the floor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I accept that as a... I, I think we would, we would be comfortable with the village goddesses. I would also be comfortable with yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, one thing I, that I'm overlook mentioning is these are not uh, these are singular moments singular episodes singular encounters they're not types they're not typical examples of so in that sense they're not meant to be representative of anything you just run into certain moments where people have done certain things been in certain ways and all of which have shaped this world that we yeah. uh, you know <laughs> consider a habitable world i mean they've not been anti life they've not been you know in that sense and um, so the, the specialness of the moments are to be severed in themselves. And they're not supposed to give us models for conduct today. Mm. It's just a range of things um, that I was inspired by. And it was an ongoing process. Um, I, I didn't come ready-made with all of them. Mm. There are more, the, the names I mentioned are not there. So Great. thank you, Gilmo. Well, um, we will perhaps ask the village goddesses for boons yes. later.